Sabbath school. Let's start our song service this morning with hymn number 250. Let's sing all six verses. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Jesus is mine. And let's sing all three verses of this song. Thank you. 
turn over a couple of pages to hymn number 466, Wonderful Peace. Let's sing all four verses of this song. number 468 I'm a child of the king and let's sing all four verses of this song
going to turn it over to him, number 470. There is sunshine in my soul today. And let's stand as we sing all four verses. We thank you, dear Father, for your love, your care, and your many mercies. We thank you for bringing us into your courts, your holy sanctuary, to worship you, to praise and adore you, and just to thank you for your many blessings and the blessings of the past six days. And now we are gathered together just to worship you because you are God, you are our Creator and a Redeemer. And we thank you for blessing us with your presence as we worship you. We ask that you will be with us throughout this day and be with those who are, and on, on who are unable to come out. Lord, grant them a blessing also. And those who are on their way, we ask that you will send your holy angels to protect them so that they may arrive safely and share in the blessings that you have in store for them. Help us that as we go through this day that we will keep our focus on you and heavenly things. And uh, uh, may we turn our minds away from all earthly matters and just stay focused on you. Lord, you are wonderful to us and we need to recognize you as such. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. And a happy Sabbath to you. And those online worshipers, happy Sabbath also. 
I'll share with you a story coming out of the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country in East Central Africa, stricken with poverty. Marcel, who lived in Kinshasa, the Congo's capital, felt like he was dying from an excruciating pain in his stomach. He had no money and didn't know what to do because no hospital would take him without a guarantee that he would pay for his medical treatment. Then someone told him about the Adventist Clinic of Kinshasa. With the assistance of his wife and children, Marcel rushed to the 15-bed clinic. To their astonishment, the medical team did not say a word about money. Instead, they showered Marcel and his family with prayer. And here's what Marcel said. The big surprise for my family and myself was the attitude of this medical team who demanded nothing and were only concerned with saving human life. The medical team ran a series of tests and found that Marcel had perforations in his stomach. It was unclear what had caused the holes. It could have been a result of appendicitis, a gunshot or a knife wound. So Marcel's case was serious. The contents of his stomach might spill through the holes and cause deadly infection. The medical team needed to perform a complicated emergency operation of which three out of 10 survived the procedure. Marcel was admitted to the clinic. However, the medical team did not have all the equipment that was needed for the operation. Arrangements had to be made to secure it. Finally, after the necessary equipment was obtained, the medical team brought Marcel to the operating room. Anesthesiologists put him to sleep. Doctors opened him up, worked carefully to repair his stomach, and then sewed him up. Marcel is convinced that it was God, not the doctors, who performed such delicate operation. He said, I was at death's door. But to tell you the truth, it was God who operated. Such a surgery on the stomach is a matter of life and death, and I am alive. Ten days after the operation, it was declared a success. Marcel said, honestly, my life is a miracle. He did everything. I cannot forget the spirit of prayer that I noticed in the Adventist clinic. The presence of God is so necessary in times of distress. Marcel said that he and his family would not forget about the clinic, the place where his life was spared. He said he would not forget about the Seventh-day Adventist church who operates the clinic. He further said, we ask the clinic to keep doing acts of kindness to everyone. I came in dying and came out alive. Praise be to the name of God. I discovered Christ through these acts of kindness. This story reminds me of the many times, the many times God saved my life.
And that's a little testimony this morning. And so I can join in with Marcel and say, my life is a miracle. I entered the hospital or hospitals dying and came out alive. It was not the doctors, it was God. Now, God works so mysteriously that his spirit led a stranger to Marcel to tell him about the Seventh-day Adventist clinic that could help him through much prayer and he would ultimately give God the praise, the honor, and the glory. Marcel will never forget the kindness he received at that clinic. The focus was not on money, but rather on saving a life. The medical team extended sympathy. They showed compassion, kindness, followed the example of Jesus, and accessed the power of God through much prayer. For we need to remember that when one recovers from disease, it is God who restores. All life-giving power is from him. We pray and he does the rest. In one of her books, Ellen G. White noted that the only avenues by which some persons can be reached are through the relief of pain. And thus it was in the case of Marcella. Through the working of the Holy Spirit from the very beginning of his ordeal, his suffering brought him into a relationship with God. The acts of kindness and sympathy that Jesus extended while here were demonstrated at the Adventist clinic, which led Marcel to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. If we follow Christ's example, we are bound to get followers for his kingdom. You see, sickness and suffering come as a result of disobedience, which started in the Garden of Eden, subtly orchestrated by Satan. However, in our disobedience, God still wants to mingle with us to get our attention. He sees us traveling down the wrong path. And in order to save us from ultimate destruction, he allows us to go through the fires of affliction that we might be transformed into his likeness, wearing his character. For that's the only way we're going to make it to heaven. No one with the slightest flaw can enter those pearly gates. So, if we really mean heaven, we need to be thankful for trials. They are designed to strengthen us and build our characters for eternal life. It's through much trial that we are to make it to God's eternal kingdom. But let me make it clear that God is never the one who causes suffering. Never. All sickness, disease, pain, and suffering of any kind is all of the devil. But you can be sure that God will use any trial that comes our way to get our attention. For his ultimate goal is to bring us the kind of healing that will last forever. All of Christ's healing miracles did not prevent people from eventually dying, but he healed in order that they would seek after the ultimate healing he offers, that is, eternal life with him in a body that will never die. From Marcel's experience, we can see that God does not miraculously heal those who are church members only. The centurion was a Gentile, not a member. 
So he sends the sunshine and the rain on everyone. The word of God says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God used his strategic method to win Marcel to him. Marcel had a choice in the matter, but God knew his heart and reached out to save him. Marcel took a hold of God's outstretched arm and accepted his call. God answered the prayers of the medical staff of the Adventist clinic, not only to heal him physically, but to have him walk in newness of life. Mission stories aren't given as a means of entertainment, but rather as a means of encouragement to participate in the saving of souls for God's eternal kingdom. And by doing so, it helps to strengthen our own walk with God, our faith and trust in him as we see the many miracles performed in people's lives through mission offerings. We might not be able to travel around the world to mission fields, but we can support global mission with our offerings. Mission offerings help to build schools, universities, church buildings, hospitals, Adventist clinics, such as the clinic where Marcel's surgery was prayerfully and successfully performed. It's used to help fund orphanages and health programs and miscellaneous operational expenses. So when we do not give to missions, the work of God suffers. It gets cut globally. We know that we cannot stop the work of God from moving forward because he has the power to finish it himself. But he has given us the privilege of participating in it. And it's such a joy, such a thrill, when we learn that someone has accepted Jesus through our efforts. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is such an organized entity that not one penny of mission offerings goes to facilitate any other project. It is designated to, which in essence is the winning of souls for God's eternal kingdom. So when we give, we're not giving to the general conference or to any division, nor union, nor local conference. We are giving in support of the work of God for the saving of souls for his eternal kingdom. We want Jesus to come, and we say that all day long, every day. If we really want, it to come, want him to come, let us make sacrifices to finish the work. Don't stop to think for one moment that you cannot give God. It's totally impossible. He owns everything. Everything belongs to him. Whatever we have are only on loan to us. So in thankfulness for his numerous blessings, we should not think twice about honoring him in sacrificing our finances or time or energy to his cause, the building up of his kingdom for eternity. Let's not hold back on God. He sacrificed everything for us. When it's time to exit this world, we'll be leaving everything behind but our character. So why not invest all we can now before that time? It's an investment for eternity. And the thrilling part about it is that when we get to heaven, someone will approach us and say, thanks for inviting me here through your offerings, and thanks for giving of yourself. 
Our mission offerings helped save Marcel's life and brought him into a relationship with God. Let us continue to support global mission and give of our best to the master this coming Sabbath, 13th Sabbath, which will be in a few weeks, just a few weeks, that someday soon and very soon as we can see, our faithfulness will allow us to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of our Lord. Father God, help us that we will dedicate all that we can to you and your service because you're about the saving of souls. You want us desperately in your kingdom. You're constantly reaching out to us, stretching out your arms to bring us in. Help us that we will make the effort in every way to garner souls in for your kingdom so that at last, in our faithfulness, we will all go home to live with you, to dwell and reign eternally. These verses we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may now be seated, be separated for your classes. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Sabbath School. It's already been a blessing. Praise God for his Sabbath day. And I agree with, well, I agree with all that she said, but I, I agree with the, the fact that you can't outgive God. You give to his work and he blesses everything. Uh, 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 th that you may not even be aware of in your life and, and so God is d it is definitely a blessing to walk with God praise God for that today um, the lesson is entitled planning for success and again we're continuing the quarter managing for the master till he comes um, planning for success let's begin with prayer Holy God in heaven, we uh, once again uh, seek your presence. We ask you to guide us and direct us, give us understanding in your word today. Uh, bless all that we do here uh, on your Sabbath day that we may honor and glorify you in all, the, all that we do. Give us understanding and lead us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You know, I think that it's... Everyone should, I think, at some point in their life, stop for a second and decide what it means to be a success in this world. We know what the worldly standard for success is. You know, Bezos is a success, right? But is he really? I mean, I don't know anything about his personal life, so, uh, but the reality is, Financial success isn't necessarily success. Sometimes financial success can destroy your family in a couple of ways. In that it is your number one goal in life, not your children, not your wife, not your husband. Your number one goal in life is your success and you'll leave them all behind if needed. You want to tag along with me, fine, but I'm going to be a success. Right? Do you think anyone becomes a billionaire without that kind of mentality? I would suggest to you that you, you have one goal and that's it. Everything else, it takes second fiddle as we used to say. Um, not to crack on someone who's been a second fiddle. I think that's a real position in an orchestra. <laughs> um, So, 
I guess you, as a Christian, you have to step back and say, well, what does it mean to be a successful Christian? What does it mean to be successful in God's eyes? Now, I believe that, in truth, I, I believe Christ's words, that, that God knows what you need. And he's going to give you the ability to, um, we'll, we'll just say it in our terms, pay your bills and, and live your life and so on. He's going to, that doesn't mean he's going to make everyone rich. It doesn't mean he's going to make everyone poor. As a matter of fact, I may need something different than you. He may be able to trust you with a million dollars in your pocket, in your purse. Me, he has a hard time with five bucks in my pocket. You see what I'm saying? I mean, he knows that we're different. And God knows everything about me and everything about you. And so he's going to deal with us differently as children. Just like a, a, a parent is going to deal with their children differently. Because they're different. And you know that from the minute they're born. This one's different than that one was, and so on. And it's really amazing, the uniqueness of every individual, isn't it? It's really phenomenal. Um, but I suspect then that my challenge in life isn't your challenge in life many times, in character, uh, and, and vice versa. So back to planning for success. So I would suggest at some point in the Christian life, we have to stop and say... Being fully dedicated to the Lord is the number one goal of being a success in life. That's it. That's the, that's the number one thing. Because it's going to change everything about what you do in life. I'm here to tell you, I told you, I've me mentioned this before, but I, I grew up... Well, I grew up an Adventist, um, and I, so I grew up a Christian um, all my life. I knew the principles, and, and I, from a... Uh, relatively young age in my teenage years um, accepted the challenge of my sa of my uh, school teacher my I, as I recall it my seventh and eighth grade uh, Bible class teacher the challenge of spending an hour a day with the Lord in the word I, I discovered it transforms your life that's what I discovered uh, you don't believe it, it's a struggle, you don't even want to pick the book up. You know what I'm saying? It, it, there is a spiritual battle when you go to read the Bible. There's a spiritual battle. That's why most people don't want to do it. They want to read some other author and what they have to say about the Bible or they want the pastor to tell them about the Bible because a spiritual battle ensues the second you go to pick up the Bible. Why do you think that is? Two reasons. Satan does not want you to read the Bible because there's power in the Word of God for your life. Power for your life. And then also you have a carnal nature that is at enmity with God. And you don't want to give it up as a human. You don't want to give your sovereignty up. You know, you're, you're your own God, you know. So there's a struggle that goes on. But I started to... I think because... I took that challenge and I began to read the word for myself. I started, I, I was confused about it, but I started looking at the things that I believed about life. What was it, what did it mean to be a success in life? Well, what, and I mentioned this, what do you need to do? Well, you need to meet somebody, you need to get married, you need to get uh, a good career one way or the other. College educated or, or start a business or whatever it is, a career. You need to um, get a house and then get a bigger house and then you need to have kids and then you need to have a bigger house and, and, and then you need a big giant nest egg and, and you need to be able to retire in luxury and this is the success path of, and, and anyone that lives that, guess what we do when we open those doors? We honor those people more than the poor. Didn't God say we shouldn't do that? Didn't he? We shouldn't show favoritism like that? You say, oh here, come sit in this seat to the rich one, but to the poor, we'll go sit over there. You know, God rebuked that kind of mentality. And all I'm saying is it goes against everything you learn in this world. I believe that God will take care of your future. He'll take care of your future. Uh, and, and God's in charge of it and in charge of your life if you give your life to him. He's in charge of your life. Okay? So the number one thing in my mind of planning for success 
is giving your heart fully to the Lord and then asking his guidance in life. And what I have found also, <laughs> and it's troubling to me, <laughs> is the subtlety of the Lord's leading. Does that trouble anybody? But God knows what he's doing. But from my standpoint, I'd like him to hit me with a lightning bolt. You know what I mean? Just tell me what to do, you know? But instead, he wants us to have some faith. And he wants us to read his word. And he wants us to pray. And he wants us, to, you know. And, and, and all I know is after looking back on years, I see the Lord's leading. In the middle of it, it's so subtle sometimes. It, do you know why it's subtle? Because he believes in freedom. He believes in letting you live your life. He gave that life to you. It is yours. He gave it to you. And he doesn't, he's not, let's put it this way. God isn't a micromanager. Now there's a lot of us that are micromanagers. We love to micromanage other people. We have a harder time micromanaging our own lives. But we love to micromanage other people. Right? That's not really the way God is. He, as a ma he, he steps back and gives us some room to even stumble and fall, just like a parent would do with a child. They want to walk. Oh, I'd like to go hold them up, but I'm going to step back and just let them do it. You know, I know they're going to fall. Oh, no. You know, and, and, and so a good parent, God, doesn't, doesn't um, in, in a strong uh, controlling fashion, his presence pushing you down the aisle. You know what I'm saying? Rather, he he gives you a still small voice to tell you this is the way walk ye in it, and he gives you the word of God for guidance and prayer for seeking his guidance and so on. So, so I, I've learned over life that God leads all the way along. But it's not always, you can't always sense it. Okay, now back to the planning for success. What I find though is that if we just taught young people, listen, do you want to be a success in life? Right now, get on your knees and dedicate yourself to the living Jesus Christ. All other things will fall into place. Things won't go your way all the time and so on and so on. It may not go the direction you think it needs to go. But if the Lord Jesus Christ is the shepherd of your soul, your life is going to be a success. Isn't that a plain simple truth? I believe that we don't have the faith to believe it sometimes. So we don't do it. No, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to get into, you know, college or whatever. I'm not picking on college, I'm, college is good, you know. Uh, but w what I'm saying is we, we focus on the externals that we can do. How many times does a person dedicate their entire life to succeeding and then they end up in a divorce? Their spouse, male or female, doesn't matter. Takes them to court, destroys their life, not that it wasn't their fault, who knows, right? Their family's divided, their kids leave the faith. Did going and, and putting your focus on worldly goals save your family? But if you have a real religion, and, and some of you are past those days, right? But you have children and grandchildren, right? You're an advisor now, okay? You're an advisor now. And so, if, if you have true, I say true religion, well, God even says, true and undefiled religion is this. So there is such a thing as a true religion, meaning a heart relationship with God, with the Lord living in you. If you really have a real living faith, do you think that can be hidden from your children? Now there was Cain and Abel. Did Adam and Eve truly believe in God? They had the, the, the most intense religion ever on earth. They met him and walked with him in the garden before they fell, right? And yet, one decided to rebel and one decided to live by faith. 
That's really what it is. One decided to shoot for his own works. The other decided to rely on God's requirements and God's works. So from the beginning, that goes on. But all I'm getting at is, young, young people, as they begin to have children, if you dedicate yourself to a living, vibrant relationship with God, your family and your life's going to be a success, even though we're faced with many trials. God, Christ said that, plain and clear. I'm not taking you out of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of it anymore. And I'm going to bless you, but you're going to have many trials along the way. Right? We did a whole study on the crucible, right? Now let's go back to this, planning for success. Let's read the memory text here, uh, starting in Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Now listen. In everything that we do, do it as to the Lord. If we live by that principle, we are going to do well. In, we'll do better than we would have done. Let's put it that way. In every th aspect of life. Listen, I am a fumbling mess when it comes to woodworking. My dad was brilliant at it. He loved, man, he had a, 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 what, a router and a, you know, everything, and he'd build stuff and all that kind of stuff. I, I think, oh, I need to build a table, and I'll take four boards and bang them together and a top on it, and then I go sit something on it, boom, falls over, right, because it doesn't have support, or whatever, you get my point. Some people have different, different talents, um, but if I dedicate what I'm doing to the Lord, I'll probably probably even be a better carpenter. You see what I'm saying? He gives wi Do you really think that God gives wisdom? Does he give aid to humans and wisdom? I believe so. Usually we don't find that out until we're in a stuck spot. We're stuck. We don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden we're pleading with the Lord. Oh, help me to know what to do. You know? <laughs> and he's like, I've been waiting here the whole time watching you, son. <laughs> watching, watching the mess that you're making. I'm glad you finally, <laughs> finally looked up. You know, um, as a good parent as he is. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. We shouldn't be half-hearted. Now see, the world is so half-hearted in everything they do now, right? Nobody wants to make an effort. They don't even want to make an effort and go, go to work anymore, right? I, I, I mean, stay home, play video games, you know, and smoke pot, you know. Or, or, do they still call it pot? <laughs> I think they call it skunkweed now. <laughs> At least they have for a while. Um, So finding what God w would call a faithful man or a faithful woman, it's becoming more and more rare, a fine gem in the world. Shouldn't we be the leaders as God's people? Not to make us something, but to just show that God's way is better. I think we always uh, admired, and I don't even know whether they do this type of thing anymore, but I think we, we tended to admire the idea of the Amish communities where one person needs to raise a, a barn and the whole community is out there and they put up a barn and I'll exaggerate because I have no real idea. In one day, you know what I'm saying? They just, they go, they get it done. I've seen the villages do, they must be Amish in the villages because I've seen them put up in higher subdivisions in no time. And then I see our, our, our lovely government agencies working on a road for 20 years, you know. I mean, year after year after year. And just the time they get it done, they decide, oh, we need to redo this and do it different. I saw them do that with that intersection in Mount Dora. I was blown away by that. They spent years working on that. And then all of a sudden, they need to change it and do it different. And they ripped it up again and did it again. I just... You know, but whatever you do, do heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Now, do you really believe you live your life for the living God? See, that's where we need to change. We grow up thinking we live our life for ourselves. But God gave you life. 
God gave you existence. There is due respect and honor towards God in living your life for Him who gave you life and then redeemed your life. Paid the price to cover your sins and to buy you back from the precipice, you know. From, um, now here's, a, here's an act of faith in this that we need to teach the young people as well. Doing it to the Lord at not, at, as not to men, but they're going to reap the benefits. If you're a faithful worker, your boss is going to reap the benefit, right? And he may not appreciate it. But you're not working for him. You are, but you, you understand what I'm saying. You're truly working for the living God. God sees everything. Your boss may not. Because they're human and they make mistakes and they're selfish, etc., etc. And, and, but God sees. And God sees the labor that you do and the hard work that you do and the dedication. And then it says... So in your hard times, think of this, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward of the inheritance. So in this world, I may work hard for the uh, promotion, and it looks like I should get the promotion. Everybody I work with believes I should get the promotion. And at the last minute, somebody that likes to go in and talk football to the boss and sit there for an hour chatting football with him gets the position. That, I, I say that because that's a little sore spot for myself because I'm not a sports person, okay? And I've seen that in my career. I, I thought, man, if I just went in there and uh, I'm not going to use the vernacular, the two letters, because it, it's got a bad word behind it, so I'm not going to say it. But we chat up. We'll just put it that way. The boss. And um, um, uh, and they they got when, when push comes to shove, he's going to side with them. That's just the way it is. That's the way humans are. And, and you want to say worldly wise people will take advantage of that. Okay. But I know I have an inheritance from the Lord. Shouldn't we take courage in life? Even when we don't get what we think we should have. Maybe God has something better for you. Maybe you don't get the spouse that you thought you wanted or whatever for some circumstance. Whatever it is. Maybe God has something better for you. And, by the way, maybe he has a little work to do on you first before you have a spouse, <laughs> right? Maybe he has a little more refined and around the edges he needs to do on you before he, he, you start a family. So be patient and wait on the Lord. Okay, let's move on here. Um, um, let's go to Ecclesiastes 12.1. And this is going right along with our, our, what we've been talking about. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. See, that is a challenge. I'm telling you, that's a challenge. The youth have far too many things on their minds. I mean, far too many things they want and want to do and want to, you know what I mean, to stop and say, wait a minute, let's get our ducks in a row. Let's get the horse before the cart, not the cart before the horse. Let's get it right. Let's first dedicate to the Lord. This is where we need to advise. Listen, they may not listen to you, but you still gave the advice, right? And when they find out you were right 30 years from now, they'll look back and say, I wish I had listened in my youth. But they will have learned their lesson, won't they? You were faithful. You said what you needed to say. And they didn't listen. But don't think that it doesn't have impact. Because in the long run, it has impact on people's lives. I remember things people said to me uh, over the years. And, and, and I, really, I think the Lord brings it back to your memory. Because he was speaking through that person at that time. You know. And motivated them to say it and so on. This is where we need to, to, to intercede for the future of God's people and their lives. Do you not believe that their life will be a devastated mess if they don't dedicate it to the Lord? Don't, don't you by now know what Satan has in store for others? If they're not being protected and led by the living Christ... 
We're still going to have hard times here. But I would rather be in a ditch with the Lord Jesus Christ there with me than to be on a beautiful highway with Satan spurring me on. Because what Satan doesn't tell you as you're going along that beautiful highway is the bridge is out. <laughs> Jesus says, get in this ditch for a minute. There's a tornado coming. <laughs> I'll stay there with you. He has a reason for everything, right? He has a reason for everything. Look here now. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And I don't like the rest of this too much because I'm getting so old. Before the difficult days come. And I'm, I'm here to tell you. I don't get up from the ground as well as I used to. I mean, I'm just blown away. And, you know, I, I get down to do something. Then I realize I got to get up and I got to like find something to get myself up, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, uh, well, anyway. Before the difficult days come, and when the years draw near, when you say, I have no pleasure in them. And like I say, I hate death. I hate the process of death. And I know that my mother and father were there. And, you, and we have, we've had many lovely brethren and sisters that were in the same boat. Whereas they neared the end, they have no pleasure in life anymore. And... Chris, over here, there's a hand. Um, um, isn't it good, though, when, when having pleasure in this world isn't the end? You hear what I'm saying? You reach that age when you're dying, you know, soon. Man, what a sad thing it is if you don't have hope. What a sadness it is when it's free. It wasn't free. It was a big price paid for that gift of inheritance, right? Christ paid the price. But it's offered free to you and to that person. The sad part is when, well, God knows the heart. And God works, I think, even on deathbed. We, we've heard of deathbed confessions and so on. Um, but isn't it better... To do what the scripture says. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why not be able to look back on life. I remember my dad doing this. He was sitting there. And he was thinking back over some of the. the, the, the Jackie. Um, so he was thinking back over some of the things that he had done. His Sabbath school class. And the different things. And he says. Oh, I'm going to bring myself to tears. I I've been very successful not doing that lately. <laughs> he says, well, I think I did some good. <laughs> he was thinking back on his Sabbath school class and how he worked for the Lord in church. But look, he introduced his children to the Lord. He, there's plenty of things that we do even when we fail and we make mistakes. We work and live for the Lord and his and my mother's steadfastness to the Lord all of our lives. That doesn't make them, that doesn't give them entrance into the kingdom. Just to be a steady Adventist paying your tithe all your life, that does not get you entrance into the kingdom. But it is a fruit of that relationship and the influence is there. So, I, I mean, but, but, but isn't it good for an old man sitting there in his chair, you know, at 88, 89, 90 years old, to be able to look back and say, well, yeah, I, I believe God used me and did good things in my life. Wouldn't it be a shame to be that age and look back and say, I have never come to the Lord. I want to come to him now. I believe what you're telling me, brother, si sister. But what a devastation I made of my life. Isn't that sadder? It's better... Remember them in the days of your youth. Hope you have a good memory. <laughs> Go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> Go ahead, Kate. Um, it, it occurred to me while you were talking about these things in this scripture, um, it seems like part of what's being said is um, that the details are important. And it's important to learn them when we're young, to pay attention to those details, because we know that God is a God of details. And when we do that, they become habits that we can more or less rely on when we're older. Um, it, it just seems like that, that's part of that whole, you know, learning these things when we're young. 
I saw uh, a little glimpse at the risk of embarrassing somebody, a glimpse yesterday of a habit that probably was not even thought of, but it made me smile. Yesterday I saw our head elder and his wife coming out of a store and he automatically reached for her hand and they walked together to the car. And I thought, how beautiful. That, that love is right there. It's a habit to hold on to each other and that, that carries you through. And it also is a beautiful witness to those around you, those little habits. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think that the, 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 the work that do, God does in your life becomes, we'll say, second nature to you, and you don't realize it. I do know that, uh, uh, that we visited some people um, not too long ago, and uh, one of the people who had been raised in a um, well, troublesome, maybe, home, um, yes, uh, I'm trying to be vague, but didn't know there was such a thing. I mean, d did, you've heard of it, right? But never really realized that people can live this way. And it, and it has an impact, you know. But that's not us. Th the way we are, we're desperately wicked and selfish. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you, you knock other people down on your way out to the car, you know what I'm saying? But the reality is, God begins to shine through in your life when you spend time with Him. I agree with that. You don't even know it. So just spend time with him. Let him change you. Because over your lifetime, people notice and see. And, and it makes an impact on others. And uh, so praise the Lord uh, for that. Um, let's look at Ecclesiastes. This really is kind of uh, similar to what we were um, already reading. But look at what it says. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says... Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. In other words, this is your life. Yes, God has given you this life. Why not do good in it? it I think that, you know that selfishness never brings happiness. Now, I'm not, I, obviously, selfishness doesn't bring happiness to other people. <laughs> if I'm selfish, it's not going to bring happiness to my family. You understand what I'm saying? But selfishness doesn't bring happiness to yourself. Because it's not the way God made us, by the way. God made us like Him, in His image, which is giving. He said, God is love. Love is unselfish giving and caring for others. That's exemplified in the way God is. So in reality, another tidbit, a jewel, a gem of knowledge teaching the youth, not only in the days of your youth, remember your creator, but realize living your life selfishly may seem like you're going to get what you want. But you will never be happy. You will never be happy in that. You'll find happiness when you get a new car. You get a brand new car. It's better than everyone else. You know, you got the, the super Tesla with solar powered connection to the satellites. There is no such thing that I don't. <laughs> but anyway, I'm saying you got the best. Better than everybody else and you can pull up to work and everyone else is envious and whatever. You will never be happy with selfishness because that thing gets a scratch on it. That thing gets old. Somebody else gets a better one. Next month, the newer... The, I, I said this before, being a computer geek, you know, um, th that I am. I don't know if you remember the early 2000s. 
Every computer you got, two months later, there was a better computer, okay? Now, they've, they're still going, that's still going on, but, the, 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 you know, they try to hide it now with all the numbers and everything so you don't even know what you're buying, you know, because in reality, but anyway, but anyway, back in those days, you'd go out and spend top dollar for that computer, and three months later, it's out of date, okay? It made you happy for three months, but now you're not happy anymore. So te that, that's temporary happiness. And people try to fill themselves. That's why credit cards get so big. Because they've got to keep that rush going. That happiness going. Got to go buy something new. Oh, I feel good again. And then it, uh, whatever it is, an endorphin rush or whatever it is. And, and then that wears off. And well, I've got to get some new clothes. And I've got to get this. And I've got to get that. And you try to keep that up till all of a sudden you can't pay all those credit card bills. And the whole thing comes tumbling down, you know. And you will never find happiness in selfishness. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave. So I think the advice here is live your life well. Let God worry about his child. And if you have given yourself to him, you are his child. And he will defend you and look out for you. All the way to the end in this world. That's not the end for us. That's not the end. But I'm longing for the end of this world. Not for the end of life necessarily. But what I mean is the end of this present state of affairs. I am longing for the day when Christ stands up and says, It is done, you know. And he throws down the censer. And he's coming back to receive us. That is not too far off. But it, before that happens, folks, I've said it before. I'll be right with you, Chris. I've said it before. How wicked does the world have to become before God will we'll say it this way, in human terms, before God gives up on it? How wicked did the antediluvian world have to become before God said, that's it. I can't do any more for them. What, how wicked did Sodom and Gomorrah have to become before he said, that's it. I'm destroying the city. There's nothing else I can do for them. But he always sends ahead, like with Nineveh. He sent the prophet. They should have been destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. But they repented. And they turned, right? And did God destroy? No. No. That actually stuck in the bonnet of, uh, of, of, of jo uh, um, Jonah um, because of that. But the reality is our world is going to... You think it's wicked. It is. It is. It's going to... The things that are going now, on right now boggle the mind, right? You just can't even believe that educated leaders would stand up and say what they say now you know it's just bizarre and I think it think it's the marvelous working of Satan I think that people have given up their protection of God they pushed God out of their lives so much they cannot see right from wrong but before the flood violence filled the land the same thing in Nineveh and, 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 and uh, the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah was abundance of ease and food and, and, and uh, pride, by the way. Not just homosexuality, even though that was rampant, obviously. Remember when they attacked the, the house. So there was violence as well, trying to get those uh, angels out of there. They didn't maybe know they were angels. They just thought they were men visiting or whatever. The wickedness of the world has to become very wicked before Jesus says, I cannot do any more. There's no one else I can save. They are holding in their sins. So be prepared. You want to stay alive until the coming of the Lord? Just beware. We are entering on one of the darkest times of earth's history. Like before the flood. But God will be with us through it. And we have a hope. And he will allow us to reach others along the way. 
Do all that you do with all your might to reach others, to make your life valuable. Listen, if you come to the end of your life and there's not a single soul that was influenced in the right way by you, by Christ in you, that's sad. That your life was such a waste. Make your life valuable today. Not by being the Holy Spirit for others, but simply get to know Christ, because I guarantee you, the closer you get to Christ, the more you cannot shut up about Him. And you'll find a way to try to reach others, because with all your might, you're working for the Lord. And you're praying and asking, I'm so sorry, Chris, I do this to people. Go ahead, Christopher. <laughs> Tell me what you had to say. <laughs> He did forget, didn't no. you? No. No, you didn't. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to suggest. Whenever you raise your hand, you get a little piece of paper and write a note. I want to tell him. <laughs> I want to say this because you know me. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> when my, my grandma passed away, there's were a carnal on my birth feeder. When... When... I was at my house, I saw a bird feeder with a bird, and the Lord said to me through bird, I am there for you, Chris. Yes. That comfort my heart. I agree with you. God does that. He sends us subtle little signs of truth. Um, and I've seen it just like you're saying that in our sorrow God sends some little message to encourage us and strengthen us that's the, that's the heritage of the people of God right there that's what we have we have a loving Savior who cares for us in our grief though he he does not like the grief either in this world but He's there for us and will strengthen us and encourage us. Um, where can I go here? Um, I want to talk about... I want to talk about Joseph. Isn't that an example of a life well spent? Did he have it easy? Now, he might have been a little too boisterous about what God was showing him when he was younger, possibly, right? The visions he had and the things that he said. Because he sure got the... I guess you could learn in wisdom on that, that even the people... Were the other 11 sons of Jacob the church as well? Were they not the patriarchs? Did they not know the true living God? Did Jacob not worship the true living God and sacrifice to the true living God? Did he not teach his children about that and so on and so on? Um, but even in the household of God, there's still a carnal nature that wants to pop up with us. The old man of sin that wants to come alive again, right? Boasting to your fellow church members, you know what I'm saying, doesn't necessarily go well, you know? And, and you've got to learn, you've got to learn um, wisdom. I think it took a pit Almost losing his life, because he thought he was going to die, I'm sure, you know, in that pit. And then being taken away as a slave, thinking, that's it. I'll never see my family again. Um, and then thinking, okay, God's blessing me. I'm finally on top of it again. And then a false accusation sends him to prison, where he spent a, quite a number of years there. Now, wasn't he faithful even in the prison? He was faithful, as a, we'll call, as a slave. He became the head of the household as far as taking care of the finances. What slave is entrusted with that? But Potiphar sure did, right? And then the jailer sure did. And then he was forgotten. He did what he was supposed to do and he even received a vision and he, and he told the guy the dream and then he was forgotten. I tell you, he had a hard life. That's why at the end of his life he said, few and evil have been my days. You know, and they don't attain to the, those of my uh, 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 fathers. So, this is, it's not impossible for us to live a faithful life if we're in Christ. 
If we're in Christ, we can live a faithful life. If you're relying on yourself, you're going to fail. And you'll look back at your life and think, man, what a failure I was. And we all have failures. <laughs> God's merciful, praise God. Uh, but let's trust in the Lord today and ask Him to guide us in our lives. We are out of time. Let's, um, let's close with prayer. Um, I've got to say this. Wait, before I pray. Sorry, you can raise your hands. I've got to say this. I just want to get this across about finances. On Thursday's lesson, talking about planning for success financially in your life. Get organized. In other words, make a budget. Know what you're spending and what you're getting in, right? Spend less than you earn. That's not an American principle. <laughs> Get a credit card is an American principle, right? Spend less than you earn. Save a portion every pay period, for the, especially for the youth. Listen to this. Get organized. Look at what your income and outcome. Where are you wasting your money? Spend less than you earn. Save some every pay period. Avoid debt. I like this. We used to say avoid debt like the plague. Now it says in here avoid debt like debt like COVID-19. <laughs> so that brings it down to home. Be a diligent worker. These are great principles to live by. And they're, they're all based on biblical principles. So this is on page 69 of the lesson. Avoid debt like the plague. Be a diligent worker. Be financially faithful with God. Pay your tithe. Pay your tithe. Remember that this earth is not our real home. So in the end, whatever happens in this world, you have a beautiful, blissful home that God has prepared for you. Let's pray again. Holy God in heaven, thank you so much for being with us. Bless us the rest of this day. We praise you and thank you for all that you do for us. Make us faithful and good representatives of you here on earth in the transformation of character that um, you've given us. We praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you today.
Good morning, church family. What a blessing to be together again in God's house. What a blessing. And I'd just like to welcome each one of you. Happy Sabbath. Uh, it's a wonderful tradition. You know, tradition, people think tradition is a bad thing. Tradition in itself is not bad. It's what is the tradition. Is the tradition, at the tradition of joining together, the Bible says it was Jesus' custom or tradition to go into the temple or to the synagogue every Sabbath to pray and to read the scripture. So we're following Jesus. When we keep the seventh day Sabbath, we're following Jesus. That was his tradition. That was his custom. That was the way that Jesus lived. Uh, and, 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 that's, and it's interesting that he went and worshipped on the day that he set aside for worship. And he worshipped his father on the, on the Sabbath. The, the Lord of the Sabbath worshipped on the Sabbath. As, as a, as, and he wasn't being worshipped at that moment. He was worshipping his father. But in heaven, we, in, this, right, in this Sabbath, we are all worshipping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Godhead. We're here to worship. And we are so blessed to be together. Is there anyone here for the very first time this Sabbath? Anyone here? I know that Mary is, and she's in the, in the parents' room. And J Jeremiah and Mary and uh, Tripp, their two-year-old, as well as uh, Jonathan. So, uh, Mary, welcome. And uh, anyone else here for the very first time? this morning. And it's not actually Mary's very first time. She just hasn't been here for a while, so we're just delighted that you're here. Uh, so let us uh, uh, go to our, to our announcements. And uh, we have a couple of second readings. And uh, we, here we have a second reading here to accept the board's recommendation for Robert Jones to serve as a greeter. Robert? Thank you so much for being willing. We have a motion, and a uh, motion for Robert to serve as a greeter. And a second. And all in favor? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Robert, for being willing and uh, to serve and to smile and to greet people as they come into the church because first impressions are important. Um, people, we want people to know that they're loved. Uh, second reading also to accept transfer of Casey uh, Remy uh, from the Morton Morgantown Adventist Church in Morgantown, North Carolina, to the Umatilla Adventist Church. So we have uh, do we have a motion to accept membership, and do we have a second? And do we is uh, Casey here right this second? She may be in the church, but she's not here in the, right in this room. But anyway, all in favor of accepting her into fellowship and opposed. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's carried and welcome, Casey. Uh, please welcome her when you see her after church. Um, and we have the March uh, schedule. And you'll notice that there is a uh, change in our picnic, our fellowship, uh, our picnic. Um, and that thankfully, by the grace of God, uh, the date was able to be changed because I did not put in my book that we had established the 5th of, of uh, I think it was the 5th, right? The 5th of, of March uh, for the original date for the church picnic. And uh, so we had already m bought tickets to go out to Colorado to spend some time with our, our son Bart and Kim and then our two little grandsons. Gavin and Max and uh, so unfortunately so it looked like we weren't going to be able to make it but we really really wanted to make it so we're so thankful that Anne changed it, got uh, another date for us and that is on the 30th of um, April so that'll be nice so we look forward to that I hope we get a nice warm day like we have today which we probably will any let's see any other questions or any other not a question so much but uh, prayer meeting uh, you can follow along prayer meeting on zoom Join us on Zoom. We had some new people on Zoom last week. Please come and join us on Zoom. It's at, uh, at quarter to seven on uh, uh, every Tuesday evening. The, the link is right there in the bulletin. When you get the electronic bulletin, you just click on that link, and it brings you right there. It's no big deal. And uh, we have a really nice time. But this is a powerful book, The Power of Prayer. Everyone has got one because we were giving them out by the hundreds, and uh, everyone should have one. 
but uh, it's a nice time to talk and we discuss and we read and discuss the uh, the book. Um, any other announcements? Uh, yes, I heard a little. Was that a whistle? A bird is in this. It's a bird managed to get in. Becky, thank you. This is it also a very special day because this week uh, our dear uh, our dear Mary celebrated her birthday, and she was uh, she was uh, she is 98. Correct, 98. I was thinking it was 97, but n 98 years old. So she is officially the oldest member of the church. Right, Mary? You're the oldest member. But you know what I love about getting older is the greatest thing about getting older is every day older we get, we get one day closer to Jesus coming. Amen. When then time stands still as far as celebrating birthdays, we won't need to at all. God bless you. Mary, thank you so much for being such a sweet uh, Christian example to all of us. Happy Sabbath. Guess what we get to do tomorrow? <laughs> Pantry is open tomorrow. What a, what a blessing. Bill and I went and we got quite a bit, what, five pallets of stuff? A whole pallet stacked of oranges, beautiful oranges, Yakima, we got a mix, a palette mix of produce and just wonderful stuff to give out tomorrow. It's such a wonderful blessing, but we can only do it if the, the faithful volunteers um, come in to separate and split up and bag up all that stuff. And what we've been doing is having to bag up at least 200 bags. So that's a lot of work for just a few hands, but many hands make light work. We'll be there at 8 o'clock to begin setting up, and at 10, from 10 to 1 is when we start um, serving the folks. So please come out. Even if you can't, can come for an hour, just come for an hour. See what goes on. See what your church is doing. It's really exciting, and it's a lot of fun. Um, we have appointed Jerry to go car to car and um, pray with people. Very important. We put literature in every one of the bags in Louisiana is always out there giving books and you know if you can't be there just take a moment Sunday and pray for the folks that come and pray that the literature be bl a blessing in their lives so God bless you and happy Sabbath thank you uh, also we're having an initiative we're giving every single family that comes an opportunity to uh, do a Bible study and we have one lady that's, uh, that is actively involved in Bible study, plus reading two of the books that she, that she loves as well. So it's really, really great. I don't know if Dave and Louise are, are they away? No. No, okay. So they'll be there. Good. Because I can't be there tomorrow, so I'm, I'm glad that they'll be there for sure. Good. Excellent. It's a lot of fun to share Jesus with our community. church both in person and on live stream what a wonderful beautiful Sabbath it is our scripture reading this morning is going to be found in 1st Peter chapter 4 verses 12 and 13 1st Peter chapter 4 verses 12 and 13 but just before that of course we want to make sure that we uh, if you're going to hand in prayer requests uh, think about what you want to put on the card and don't forget the praise reports and at home you, now is a great time to be reflecting and recalling what God has done for us throughout the week and what we'd like him to do for us beyond that so it's just a wonderful time to be able to call that to mind because we're going to be going to prayer very shortly but the scripture reading again is 1 Peter chapter, chapter 4 you have a hard time finding chapter 12 chapter 4 verses 12 and 13. Beloved, 
Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be re revealed, ye may also ye, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. And would the deacons please pick up any prayer request cards? They're being handed in. going to bring your attention to uh, some special prayer needs, uh, some of which uh, are on our prayer list, and uh, maybe someone I'm missing here, but uh, I believe George Fest is going on this weekend, correct? Yeah. And we have volunteers going to be going uh, to the table. That's a big, big event in Eustis, and uh, I, let's pray that uh, we'll have, uh, many people will show an interest, we'll get start Bible studies, start uh, uh, receive literature and uh, make some new friends uh, at George Fest. We want to pray for Yoli. She's uh, really struggling up and down with her health. Pray for George Fest. Um, uh, Bob, Bob B, uh, Bob and Karen, uh, he's home. Uh, he went from uh, on, the, on the edge of death last Friday night to doing amazingly well. You know, God really answered prayer. He got good medical care, and uh, the Lord used that to revive him. So he's at rehab. He's at Rulin. Rulin. If anyone wants to go and see Bob, uh, he'd be delighted to have a visitor uh, or two at uh, Rulin. And uh, and if you don't know where it is, just get in touch with me. And also, we want to praise the Lord for Paul and Elnora. Uh, praise the Lord. Welcome. Welcome. And we'll just continue to uh, lift up Paul and Elnora. And we thank the Lord for Mary. And uh, pray for our Hilltop visitors uh, tomorrow and for our, our team. And uh, Jan, who's one of our um, volunteers at Hilltop, she loves helping at Hilltop. And her husband, Lester, passed away yesterday. And uh, she's a member. She says, I have three churches I love. Forest Lake, um, membership is at... Uh, in, uh, at, in Mount Dora, and she loves here. So she's, I said, it's okay, it's one church. Seventh-day Adventist is one church, and you have different places that you attend, but it's one church. Amen? Amen? One church worldwide. Anywhere you go in the world, when you find a, world, uh, find a church, it could be just under a tree with a couple of little benches and some place in Africa possibly. It uh, could be a little, you know, a very humble place. It could be New York City, a little storefront church that's narrow at the front and it just goes way back like <laughs> forever. I mean, we've been in churches all over the world. And, but the beautiful thing is the Spirit of the Lord is there with those people and they're worshiping on the Sabbath all over the world and uh, every Sabbath and, and serving the Lord and finding new people to share Jesus with. So that's what we're all about. And uh, so we just want to remember these dear ones, and there may be others as well that are... are, are, are pardon? Oh, yes, Desreen. Desreen, yeah, her hemoglobin went way low. She had got uh, two units of blood yesterday, and I went and visited her while she was getting her blood. And... Uh, and uh, so Desreen, thank you. And Desreen, good morning. I know you're always there with us. And uh, we'll be praying that, uh, that uh, you get to the, get to the bottom of, of what is going on there for you. Uh, so remember Desreen, give her a call, pray for her, send her a card, encourage her on her journey too. Also, we want to remember in prayer this morning... Um, Mike M, Sheila M, Gwen M, and Don M as well. And we uh, want to keep, again, 
the George Fest, you know, we, we have the, the prayer book where people can write prayer requests in there. And also keep in prayer that the Lord has his way and not the enemy. I was there last night and it was great. We had a lot of nice visits, gave, gave away a good amount of material, but we weren't the only ones there. They had a big name country music group there last night and they were very loud. So we want to pray that that, that that still small voice penetrates the piercing din of the worldly music that's there and touches hearts, you know. I mean, the Lord's work is out there, but Satan is out there hot and heavy as well. So we need to really keep that, the success of that, of that ministry in prayer. Yeah. <clears throat> um, also, uh, we have a praise report, and that is uh, Dr. Chang's uh, uh, mom, Suni, is uh, doing uh, very well. She's out of the hospital, she's home, and uh, so she's really coming around. So let's continue to lift her up as well. Thank you. As you kneel as far as possible, we will sing our prayer song. Father in heaven, it is our privilege, Lord. It is our responsibility, yes, our duty. But also, Lord, it is to our great delight and your great delight that we meet together in prayer this morning. We know, Lord, that you're concerned about each and everything that goes on in our lives because it all affects our walk with you. Lord, many are the requests, Lord. Many are the needs, many are the burdens, Lord, the sicknesses, Lord, the, the disappointments, Lord, the, the heartaches, Lord, the things that, that, that attack us spiritually, Lord. There are so many different ways that the enemy uses to get at us. But we know, Lord, that you are God. We know, Lord, that beside you there is no other. And we know, Lord, that you have authority over all things. This is why we bring all things unto you. We're encouraged to do so. We're invited to do so, Lord. You tell us to bring all of our prayers and supplications before you, Lord. But we also know that you're a God of blessing. And Lord, you provided us all with blessings this week too numerous to count. In spite of all the bad, in spite of all the bitter, in spite of all the disappointment, Lord, one little drop of the sweet from you takes care of all of that. And we just ask you, Lord, for your strength. We ask you, Lord, to increase our faith, Lord, to open our eyes wider that we might look upon you more. Lord, that we might believe you, Lord, that we might believe your promises and trust in your word and know that you'll never leave us nor forsake us and know that you're God and again beside you there is no other. You're our healer. You're the one who gives us our strength. You're the one, Lord, who gives us our reason to get up and get out every morning. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful blessings, Lord, for the big things, the little things, the simple things, and all the in-between things, Lord, because we know that you love us. Lord, let us discover each and every day more and more just how much you love us. And Lord, let us all just raise up prayer and praise to you this morning while we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 528, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. As far as possible, please stand as we sing hymn number 528.
Well, now's that wonderful time when we get to honor the Lord with our giving. He has so many different ways for us to participate with Him and team up with Him and partner with Him in His work. And this is just one small way that makes a huge difference. Because we know what He can do with the little bit that we give Him and the awesome blessings that He turns it into. And I don't know about you, but I wanted to see Him do more and more with it. So may the Lord richly bless you as you honor Him with your giving today. Father, we do praise you at this time. We thank you, Lord, for the means that you've given us, Lord, and all of the wonderful many blessings, Lord. And we gladly turn these funds, Lord, that were collected over to you because we know what you can and will do with them, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that they go to reach souls in ways that we can't even imagine, Lord, to the end that your kingdom, Lord, will be populated. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. because we're going to call all lambs and lamb wannabes to help with the lamb's offering this morning so that uh, we can make sure our young ones receive that good, solid Christian education.
catch fire. <laughs> thank you, AR, and thank you, Dr. George, for, wow, we're being blessed with lots of um, wonderful music today. So, um, good morning, girls. <laughs> No boys here today. Um, so, uh, have you ever, and uh, my apologies uh, to anyone that might have been in Plymouth Serrano last Sabbath, because you're going to hear the same one. <laughs> anyway, um, have, you, have you ever played the telephone game where either people sit in a row, stand in a row, or in a circle, and so the way it works is, one person whispers something, yes, and then it goes on down the line, and then, and then the last person says what they think was said, and it can be really funny, right? Because sometimes it's really different than what the first person said. So anyway, I, I was reminded of that game the other day when I was talking to my son, a Nathan. So Nathan works in a factory slash warehouse. It's a really big place and they they bottle Febreze and all kinds of stuff like that and then ship it out all over the US. And so anyway, um, they were coming I think to the end of his shift um, when um, he got notification that one of the workers had been shocked. So it, you know, so someone called 911, and um, I think the way it worked is that someone told the security guard, and the security guard called 911. So my son had the woman who was shocked uh, in his office, talking to her, you know, to see if she was all right and seeing what happened, and because he had to file a report, and he heard a noise outside of of his office door, so he went out to see you know, what was going on, and he said these three policemen were walking toward him with assault rifles. And um, so he was wondering, why are they here? You know, especially why are police here with assault rifles? So anyway, it turned out that, um, you know, he talked with them, and they came because they got a message that someone had been shot and that um, there could be like an active shooter there in the warehouse, so, you know, they came expecting that. So somewhere between the person who reported to the security guard, the security guard who called 911, the 911 dispatcher who would have called the police, and the police who received it, somewhere the message got that someone had been shocked. Two, someone had been shot. That's pretty different, right? So um, anyway, that made me think about how, you know, in this case, of course, no harm was done, right? Everything was fine. They probably all had a little laugh, and then everyone went on their way. But um, it really shows how things can really get twisted sometimes. and. Um, you know, when messages are passed from one person to another. And um, that makes me think about gossip, you know. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, gossip uh, can really hurt people, and the Bible tells us not to do it. So I was looking online, and what is gossip? And I thought this definition was really good, and someone defined it as... Um, Gossip is bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. So let's think about the three components of that. Bad news behind someone's back and from a bad heart. So bad news, let's think about that. So gossip is never, hey, did you see what, um, you know, did you see Brianna won an award? You know, that wouldn't be considered gossip, right? You're just sharing some, something good about it. But if someone said, did you see what Brianna just did or what she said or something, that's gossip, right? And um, we might think it's fun, you know, or it's exciting to share some bad news about somebody. And maybe it makes us 
feel better about ourselves because we're not as bad as they are. Um, you know, but here's what the Bible says. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. So keep your tongue from evil, so saying bad things, right, about other people. And, and it talks also about lying. So let's think about the second part, behind someone's back. So if you, if you couldn't say what you were going to say directly to the person or in front of them, you probably shouldn't say it, right? If you, because, you know, yeah, it's probably not something good. So if you can't say it directly to that person or like if the person's in a group and you're talking about them, you probably shouldn't say it. So, and here's what the Bible says. Don't let, let do not let, I'm sorry, don't let unwholesome words unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building each other up. That's what the Bible says. Um, according to their need, so it may benefit those who listen. So our words should be helpful and not harmful. And then the last part is out of a bad heart. So we usually don't have good motives, right, when we're talking bad about somebody else. So um, that means our heart isn't right with God. And here's a word from the Bible too, which is, speaks to all of us. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, that makes you think of a horse, right? Keeping a rein on it. Don't keep a tight rein on their tongues. Deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. So, think about it. Gossip is the opposite of the gospel. Because gossip is bad news and the gospel is good news. Right? And so, let's focus on spreading the good news about Jesus and instead of talking negatively about other people. Brianna, do you want to say something? Instead of always, like, <laughs> instead of thinking that it was, like, bad news gossip was, I always thought that it was, like, a lie or untruthful things you were saying instead of, like, bad things like if you're saying like oh did you hear so and so did this you could say that to their face without them being upset because it's true but if you say a lie about them I think that's more understanding of that so that is true um, but let's say somebody did something really bad and it was true you might want to keep that to yourself though right because if you spread it around and it makes the other person look bad to everybody else, then, you know, it might be true, but it might be something bad, right? We all make mistakes, don't we? So we shouldn't focus on w the bad things that other people do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, well, let's have a little prayer. Father, thank you for your word that gives us instructions about how to live like in harmony with heaven. So Lord, as we go through our week this week and all the weeks ahead, help us, Lord, to think good things and to say good things about other people, to build each other up and not to tear each other down. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Why I love Denise so much, can't you? She's so awesome. She's amazing.
Thank you so much, George. Thank you so much, Betty. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you so much, A.R. Thank you so much, Shandell. Praise the Lord. We've had wonderful music today. And heaven loves music. It's going to be the angelic choir. And guess what? We're all invited to be part of the choir. And we'll all learn. I know we at least really will be playing at least one instrument. And that's the harp. But with God, with so much variety, there must be uh, millions and billions of different styles of harp to have perfect music. But I'm sure we'll be uh, exploring other instruments as well in God's kingdom. But the bottom line is to be there. Yes. Isn't that going to be amazing? And there's absolutely no reason why any one of us would not be there. I mean, Jesus has done it all for us in terms of he's done everything on his side of the equation for us. He's, ex you know, shown us his love, his amazing love that he has for us, that he'd be willing to lay down his life for us. That is incredible, isn't it? That's love. You know, it's hard, it's hard to really, we just need to spend more and more time with him and especially going through those moments leading up to those, you know, the, the last week, you might say, leading up to Jesus' uh, sacrifice for us. <clears throat> Go over it and over it and over it in our minds and, and try to understand that love and how he came to that point where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you forsake me? That was Jesus' humanity he did not, he didn't see any divinity anymore. He didn't, he, he did not know at that point in his experience that he would be resurrected. He had, he had lost all hope of the resurrection. So he was, what he was doing is tasting the second death. The second death. That is the death that one does not wake up from. God does not teach, and the scripture does not teach that he's burning people in eternal hell. That they're going to be writhing around in the flames, burning and burning and burning and suffering horribly uh, for eternity. That is not the God we serve. It's life or death with God. Life or death. It's a life or death decision that each one of us make every day and all through the day in the choices we make. The good news is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's a choice of perish. We either perish or we have, we accept the gift of everlasting life. The wages of sin is death. We earn death. But the gift of eternal life is free from Jesus. Amen? Amen? So the second death. So Jesus is where we want to put our focus on and appreciate him more and more. He was willing to suffer eternal death for you and me. He was, he said, it's better that I, I, to save each one of us, to save each one of us, it would be better for us, for me to die eternally so that they can be saved. That's amazing. He stepped down completely. He became, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus makes that wonderful exchange. He exchanges our, he takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. That is amazing. So by faith, each one of us are righteous. That's why there's no reason for us to be lost. 
It, we, he, he, we are righteous in Jesus. He accepts us. We are his beloved. We are his, God looks at us as if we've never sinned. We've never made one mistake. He looks at us as if we are his son and daughter because we are. He looks at us as he looks at Jesus. It's amazing. This is amazing grace. And then as we live our life each day through the power of the Holy Spirit, he begins a special work called sanctification, a big Bible word, but it's a word that he makes us holy. He makes us loving. He makes us kind. He makes us where we don't gossip. We don't say anything bad about anybody. If we have to say something bad about somebody, we need to go to them personally and say, I'm really concerned. The way you're acting, what you're saying, what you're doing is I'm concerned that you may be uh, on the wrong path. You may, this might be a path to death, not a path to life. You know what I'm saying? We need to be more transparent with each other, more honest with each other, more. That's if you say you love somebody, but you, when they're in a, in a problem, in a situation that could lead to them losing eternity, don't you think it would be a, a loving thing to do? To, to bring that person, uh, to share good news with them, that we, God has put it on our heart, that we love them, but that there's something wrong in their life, and that, that, that wrongness in their life is actually separating them from, from, from their God, and they could die. Don't you think we need to have an obligation to help somebody in that situation? Rather than gossip about them, gossip about them, we need to be praying for them, and if the Lord puts it on our heart to go and talk to that person, we need to do that. You know, that's hard to do. And I have failed to do that many times. And I, and I ask for forgiveness from God and from you. Because if I'm aware of something in your life that is not right, it's my responsibility as your pastor, because you call me pastor. If I'm really a pastor, a pastor and you're a lamb that's gone astray and I don't make any effort to, I just watch you go. What kind of a shepherd is that? That is not a shepherd. So if, you know, if I have to, I'm going to speak to any one of you, uh, it, because it's my responsibility. You know that if I don't speak that, your sin is on me? Not that I, I, I you know, that's not the motivation. The motivation is because if, if, if someone is in a fault, in a sin, the Bible says to go and restore them. But watch out for yourself. What does it say in Galatians chapter 6? But it's not just for the pastor to do that. Sheep need to help other sheep, Right? If you're a sheep and one of your brothers or sister sheep are, are on their way over the precipice, they don't realize they're on the on 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 uh, they're in a, they're on a on a on a, on a ledge and they're just about to uh, it's going to give way and they're going to be dead. Don't you think you have a responsibility to help that dear one and to bring them to bring them into uh, into a safe place? If I think if the church is doing that, that's why I like AA. AA, everyone admits. That, hey, I'm an ho- alcoholic. We should come in every Sabbath and say, look, I'm Rob. I'm a sinaholic. Without Jesus, I'm addicted to sin. With Jesus, he's given me the victory. Amen? The victory is in Jesus. And if I continue in sin and profess to be a Christian, and you see that, you have an obligation to come and speak to me and say, Pastor, I know, I know people that are going through trials right now, and they are being refined by those trials. Those trials are refining them. It's making them new again. Getting a brand new heart, a brand new experience. They didn't know through that. But it was that trial that broke them. And now they're growing like they've never grown before. It's amazing. And just, just Galatians. Then I'm going to pray. Galatians chapter 6. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear each other's burdens. Isn't that beautiful? We're bearing each other's burdens. We're not knocking, you know, like the old story goes, you, when someone's down, you kick them in the head when they're down. You know, that's what Christians too many times do. We kick each other when we're down. Somehow it's something along with what Denise was saying that, you know, you sort of feel better because that person's down and now, you know, you think you're up because they're down. No, we need to be down with them. We need to be restoring them, helping them up, not kicking them when they're down. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that you, you took all of our sin on yourself 
at the cross and you came to that point where you recognized that you, that, that you felt totally abandoned by your father. You went through the second death for all of us so that we can have eternal life. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Please forgive us where we fail you so miserably. But thank you, Lord, that you're patiently working with each one of us. You're refining us. You're, you're preparing us for eternity. And we are so looking forward to being with you there. And we know it's nothing in us that would get us there. It's only your righteousness that you impute to us as a gift and you impart to us through the power of the Holy Spirit every day that makes us holy. But Lord, it's not anything that we do. It's what you have done for us that truly saves us. Our, our works, our actions are simply an expression of our love for you as we treat others with love and, and respect. It is the way we, we treat you. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and bless our time together now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before I carry on, I had a couple of people that came to my mind that uh, when I was sitting, uh, I want to remember Barbara, and that's uh, Perry, Perry's mom and Paz's mother-in-law. She had a fall. She fractured, uh, what was it? Shoulder. Oh, yeah, her shoulder. Her shoulder. She had, so she's really suffering. She's, she is really suffering right now. So we just pray for Perry and Paz as they support her and, and praying for her healing. And, uh, and then we want to praise the Lord for how Bob is doing. Praise the Lord that Karen's here today. Welcome, Karen. Put your hand up. Where's your hand? There it is. There it is. Good. And then we want to thank the Lord for George, our, our visitor, good friend of, of, um, uh, of uh, Jules and, and uh, Robin. And uh, we're delighted that you're here with us, Dr. George. And um, also, Tim is recovering from a surgery. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, another thing that I don't think we've really publicly announced, but uh, Annalise, uh, Annalise, uh, Annalise is, uh, got a job, and she's up in North Carolina. Is that correct? Yeah, so she's got a job in computer. Uh, she's a computer scientist. And uh, so that's exciting, but uh, I, don't, I wasn't here anyway. I never said bye-bye. So uh, we just send our prayers and our love to her, and uh, we're proud of her. And uh, of course, Marissa's continuing on, pushing on the, you know, doing the uh, medical student route, and Samantha's out there uh, in, a, in, a, in between her, her uh, nurse, uh, nursing, uh, travel nursing. So lots of good things happening. Ben, not here today. Is he, send our love to him. He's not feeling great? No. Oh, yeah, so that, who else did I miss? Joe, I, I could start going off on a <laughs> long, but hi, say hi to Joe, please. We love Joe. And uh, he's not super well, but uh, uh, he'll, he'll appreciate it. Maybe he's watching, who knows. Anyway, there's so many people we could talk about, and, uh, but <coughs> every single one is so precious to us. Rachel, not feeling super well. Just a few people that came to my mind. But the bottom line is, here we are today, and we've been talking about trials and the place of trials in our Christian experience. And um, I want to just read something. I've read it here before. I, I really need to read it again today. And uh, then I'll just cover another few areas. I want to have a short testimony uh, from Rich. He has something to share that I think fits into this, uh, into this journey. Um, and it is... Uh, uh, this is, these are some wisdom words from uh, the Ministry of Healing. It says that uh, it's, we're, it says, it is our own character and experience that determine our influence upon others, our character and experience. In order to convict, convince others of the power of Christ's grace, we must know its power in our own hearts and lives. So often we want to correct others and we want to lead them to Christ. And yet our own experience, we're not walking with Jesus ourselves. What kind of, don't you think words trying to lead someone to Jesus when you're not walking with Jesus yourself are empty words? You know, people say, oh, those Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. 
You know, they say one thing, but they do an opposite thing. You know, God wants our words. He wants us to be in such harmony, in such closeness with Jesus, that our, our words are an expression of his love, and his transforming power and grace, so that we, that's what his goal for us. And every single experience in life uh, is designed to bring us closer to Jesus. The trials, the perplexities, all the, the challenges are, are designed to lead us to a closer dependency on Jesus. He said, in my weakness, your, in, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. As we sense our weakness, we are driven to Jesus. We are driven in two places. We can see our weakness and be driven away from Jesus. That's what the devil wants, right? Or we can see our weakness and be driven to Jesus and as total dependent children, like the demoniac falling at the feet of Jesus, and he couldn't even cry out, Lord, save me, like Peter could when he was sinking. He couldn't even pray, because, but the demon spoke through him, but Jesus heard his cry for help because he hears our heart. He knows our heart. He hears our cry, and he wants to answer so badly, and, 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 and he does. If we open our hearts, simply ask him, he will come in and transform us and change us. So the gospel we present for the saving of souls must be the gospel by which our own souls are saved. Amen? Amen. Don't spout out a bunch of theory. Philosophy. The world will not be saved by philosophy. Now it is true. Paul did say, that I could preach the gospel and bring others to Christ and myself be a castaway. It is true, but don't do that. Paul didn't do that. I don't, I don't know of any experience in Paul's, in Paul's life as we study it from the Bible that he did some horrible thing and had to go and repent. I don't know of any experience like that. It's not recorded. I'm, he was still a human being, obviously, but he was transformed. By God's grace, he did all his bad stuff before he came to Jesus. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he didn't, um, well, he did have a little bit of an issue with John Mark, but that got resolved, so praise the Lord. Um, so, at any rate, uh, only through, the, through a living faith in Christ as a personal Savior is it possible to make our influence felt in a skeptical world. Do people have a reason to be skeptical, especially about Christians? who have professed to be, you know, the followers of Christ and done horrible things in so many different ways and in so many different places around the world. So, so, so it's only through a living, a living faith in Christ is our personal Savior. I love the term personal Savior. We have our own personal Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our own personal Savior. You know, he's your personal savior too. The neat thing is, he connects with every one of us as if there's not another person in the world to connect with. You know, he connects one to one with us. It says, um, if, we, uh, if, we, if we would draw sinners out of the swift running current, our own feet must be firmly set upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Amen? The badge of Christianity is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but it is, it is that which reveals the union of man with God. When we're united with God, his spirit fills us. By the power of his grace manifested in the transformation of character, the world is to be convinced that God has sent his son as its redeemer. When will that happen? When will the whole world be you know, the whole world will see a revelation of the character of Christ. When does that happen? In the timeline, the eschatological timeline leading up to Jesus' coming. When does that happen? What verse in the Bible? What verse? No one? Come on now. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. Let's read it. Chapter 18 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. It's called the fourth angel. We have three angels, and three angels do their special work in bringing, uh, bringing the gospel to the world, the everlasting gospel. 
It's the and it, you know the second angel rep, uh, you know brings it that that we're down to that last that last uh, that last leg just before the close of probation, and under the power of what's called the latter rain, the latter rain power which brings it ripens the whole the the harvest. We read these words, and after these things, I saw another angel. That's the fourth angel come down from heaven, having great power. See, these angels are messengers, and the, it's not an angel doing it. It's angel. Angels unite with fallen human beings like you and me, and it comes with great power. And the earth was lightened by his glory. So the whole world is, sees the glory of God. What is the glory of God? His character. How does the world see his character? It's manifested in the life of those who are his followers. Here are they, here's the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, and the faith of Jesus. So it's manifest, the whole world sees the character of God. You know, as because uh, he's written his law of love in our hearts and our minds. And so now a skeptical world will we'll be able to see uh, the real true power of the gospel. The whole world will be lightened by his glory. So just before, excuse me, just before Jesus comes, under the power of the latter reign, and the two issues on worship, where those, one group is worshiping the creator God, worship him who created the heavens and the earth and the fountains of waters, the creator God is being worshiped, that's Jesus the creator, and God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we're worshiping the Godhead, keeping the seventh day Sabbath because Jesus in, uh, invites us to do that. He said to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So that's the creator of God. And then the false system, a human system of worship that compels people, forces people, and threatens people. You've got to bow down and worship me, and if you don't, you're not going to be able to buy or sell, and ultimately we're going to put you to death. So that's two groups. One group worshiping the creator God by freedom of choice. They're choosing to worship him. The other group being compelled and forced to worship a false system. We're going to be worshiping one of the two systems in the end. Well, one, God is not a system. It's a, a loving creator invitation to come and worship him. And then the other group is a forced, compelled group, compelled to worship uh, a false system. And, uh, and that, that group does not have the faith to believe that the living God can take care of them during those, during those times. But the whole world is going to see a fresh revelation of the love of God. The whole world will be lightened by his glory. And you remember the three angels' message, the first angels' message, it does specifically say that we're to give him glory. We're going to give him glory. Because, and that is, and let the character of Christ be developed in us. And so that's what this is talking about. It says, by the power of his grace, manifest in the transformation of character, God's people transformed. Not just one here, one here, but a whole mass of God's people uh, transformed by the, by the power of Christ through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The latter rain goes out to the world. And the world is to be convinced that God has sent his son as its redeemer. It's never happened that you would have that many people elevating or glorifying and lifting up God in the world. This never happened before. We've had small groups here, small groups there, small groups here through the Reformation and down through time. But in the end, God will have his people. His commandment keeping people and do not get af they're not afraid of the consequences of serving God because they have the faith to believe that God can see them through. Amen? Are there examples of God seeing them through? Seeing, seeing his people through? Has God ever given an example of how he's seen people through? How about 40 years in the wilderness eating manna and having, drinking water out of a rock? Is that, can God take care of us? Absolutely. Some people think that we're going to be taken off planet earth and then the plagues are going to fall and then all this stuff is going to happen. That is not biblical. God is, he, you know, read Psalm 91 if you want to understand how God works. God takes care of his people. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they stood up and they did not bow down and worship the idol, you know, and were compelled, that was compelled worship. They were being forced to worship. And what did they do? They stood up to the king. 
And God is able to take care of us. But if he doesn't, we will still not serve you. Amen? He, they stood with the Lord. And, and so then they were thrown into the furnace. And who was with them in the furnace? Jesus was with them in the fiery furnace. If you're going through a fiery trial right now, know that the Lord is with you through it. And become aware of that. No other influence can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. That world will, the whole world will be see that. Now it's got to start somewhere, you know, like a river. It's the trickle here and a trickle there that all coming together makes the river. And, and then the whole river at a certain point in time will, just, will be shown to the whole world. Because this thing is going to be, the whole world is going to have to make a decision. And God's people uh, all around the world, his people, his faithful people. Now, during this time, there's going to be a tremendous shaking. We call it the shaking. In other words, those who are unfaithful, who, who uh, will, um, will leave God's church. The Adventist church will see a massive exodus of people who are insincere, La Laodicean, you might say, insincere and on do not have the faith to go through uh, the end time. They do not have the faith. When they don't have the faith to believe that God can take care of them when you're not going to be able to buy or sell. You know, you, they don't have that faith. And so they're going to leave the church. And actually we're told that those people will be our worst enemies because they know us. And they'll be our worst enemies. But will God see us through? Absolutely. Don't be shaken out. You've got to be attached to Christ. So through this, but to get to the point where we will stand with Jesus uh, during these trials, we have to have such a close walk with him. And he knows he has to refine us in order to prepare us to stand at that time. So I'm going to read this and I want to have Rich come up and share uh, what God has been doing for him. So I want to read this. It says, uh, so it's the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. To live such a life, to exert such an influence, costs at every step effort, so sacrifice and discipline. And that is the discipline of walking with Jesus and depending on Jesus. No matter what comes your way, you depend on Christ. No matter what happens, you depend on Christ. Uh, uh, it says, uh, this, uh, this is a section, I got this compilation of the powerful quotes from Ellen White dealing with trials. And it's amazing. It says, every heart will be tested every character developed. It, it, it is principle that God's people must act upon. The living principle must be carried out in the life. Uh, we are too quickly discouraged and earnestly cry for the trial to be removed from us. You know, I've had moments and many times when a trial starts heading my way and I just, you know, sometimes you just want to die. You just don't want to face it. Or you want to run the other way. Or you want to think, oh man, this has to be a nightmare and I'm going to wake up and it's not there anymore. Have you ever had that experience? You just, this is a nightmare that I, I, I this can't be happening. It can't be happening. But God is in it. Don't be discouraged. It said, we're too quickly discouraged and earnestly cry for the trial to be removed from us when we should plead for patience to endure and grace to overcome. So what should we be praying for? Lord, take this trial from me or what we should be praying for? Patience to endure and grace to overcome. I like that. Here's the patience of the saints. Patience to endure and grace to overcome. Our Heavenly Father measures, and I love this, this is so powerful. Our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before he permits it to come upon the believer. Nothing can come your way that God has not permitted for a purpose. And it says, he considers the circumstances, the strength of the one who is to stand under the proving and uh, under the proving and test of God. He never permits the temptations to be greater than the capacity to resist. Never permits the temptations to be greater than the capacity to resist. If the soul is overborne, the person overpowered, this can never be charged to God 
as failing to give, st give strength in grace. But the one tempted was not vigilant and prayerful and did not appropriate by faith the provisions God had abundantly in store for him. Christ never failed a believer in his hour of combat. The believer must claim the promise and meet the foe in the name of the Lord and he will not know anything like failure. I really like that. Listen to this. The believer must claim the promise and meet the foe in the name of the Lord. So when the, when the devil comes to try to take us down, what do we do? We must claim the promise. There are so many promises in God's word that we can claim against the evil one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you're tempted, submit yourself to God. In the power of Jesus, resist the devil. And what will he do? He will flee. That's a promise. We've got to claim those promises. That's where the power is, is in his word. Jesus claimed the promises. When he was tempted, he was tempted at all points like we are and yet without sin. And he was tempted, he met the temptation with what? It is written. The power is in the word. What's it called? The sword of the spirit. It's the sword. We take care of these things with the sword. And so Christ never failed a believer in his hour of need. The believer must claim the promise and meet the foe in the name of the Lord. And he will, know, he will not know anything like failure. I like what Paul says up there. God can do anything but fail. God can do anything but fail. And that's right along the line of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation has taken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Amen? Amen? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. God will never, ever, ever let you go through a trial that you can't, through his power and through his transforming love, overcome. It is, it is obstacles that make men strong. It is difficulties, conflicts, rebuffs that, 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 uh, that, may, that, that make men moral sinew. Too much ease and avoiding responsibility have made weaklings and dwarfs of those who ought to be responsible men, of, or I could say women too, of moral power and strong spiritual muscle. And then here's one here. Fear, fearful tests and trials await God's people. What awaits us? Fearful tests and... Do you not think that you're having, gonna have just a life of ease? It's not gonna happen. As the pressure of, of, of and the, uh, the devil, as God withdraws the, the, the spirit, you know, he's holding back the winds of strife until my people are sealed. In the sealing process, he pulls back this, the, the, uh, the, 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 the winds of strife are being released as he pulls back. And God's people are under more and more and more pressure. And that's when God provides more and more and more power as we by faith claim that. So fear, fearful tests and trials await God's people or the people of God. The spirit of war is stirring the nations from one end of the earth to the other. Is that true? Now they're talking about war with China. Uh, those who at Pentecost were endued with power from on high were not thereby freed from further temptation and trial. They were repeatedly assailed Will we be a repeatedly assailed by the evil one? Once you go through one trial and you just have a little bit of a time out, time out, you know, from the trial. But isn't it interesting? It doesn't take long before another trial shows up. But if you were faithful with that first trial, you're stronger now in Christ to stand with the second trial. You know what I'm saying? But if you give in every single time, you get weaker and weaker in the trials. But that's not how God wants to do it. They were repeatedly assailed by the enemy of all truth who sought to rob them of their Christian experience. Don't let the devil rob you of your Christian experience when you're going through trials. Do not give up. 
keep looking to Jesus. The devil wants us to go down, and he wants to take us down hard. They were compelled to strive with all their God-given powers to reach the measure of the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Daily they prayed. This is the early believers at, after Pentecost. Daily they prayed for fresh supplies of grace. The day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was powerful. But did that help them? Did that provide the power they needed for the next day? No. It's a daily, we have to daily be imbued with that power. It's not once and then never again. That's not how it works. It's a daily fresh uh, infilling of his spirit. Daily they prayed for fresh supplies of grace that they might reach higher and still higher towards perfection. People say, oh, I can never be perfect. Of course I can't be perfect in and of myself, but I can, uh, but I can through Christ, if uh, that's what his whole program is to refine me and to perfect me and to polish me and present me faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. It's not me being perfect, it's Christ taking a broken human being like me and making me like him because that's what his whole goal is. He took our sins to give us his righteousness. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Does that scare you? No, because you go to Jesus. If you're scared, it's because you're depending on yourself. But if you're celebrating and saying, Jesus, I, it's, this is tough. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm temp depending on you. You're going to see me through. So it goes here. Uh, it says here, under the Holy Spirit's working, even the weakest. I, anyone weak here? I'm weak. I could be lying on my, I could be lying like this, and I could go like this. <laughs> if, my, if my legs were arms, then I'd have four arms up. But in this case, I have two legs and two arms. The weakest, but this is such a powerful quotation. Do you know why God gave us the spirit of prophecy? To encourage, to encourage us and to give us, to strengthen our faith. It's not that the Bible, that the Bible has everything we need. But God, the lesser light, points us to the greater light so that we can appreciate those promises because we're told that we are to claim the promises of God. Those are precious promises and that by them we can overcome by, uh, see, how does it go uh, from Peter? We partake of his divine nature and overcome, uh, divine nature and overcome the world through lust. Through faith, well, it's through faith, but it's the lust. I, I've got to quote that. Someone find that text. It's in, I think it's Second Peter chapter 1. But it's, it's a promise. It's, it's all about the promises. It's all about the promises. And it'll create such a tremendous, uh, powerful experience for God's people in the end. It says, Second uh, Peter chapter 1. According to his, as his divine power has given unto us all things and per that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, that hath called us from glory to uh, called us to glory and virtue, whereby in verse four, this is the best uh, best verse here on this, whereby so Second Peter chapter one and verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's powerful. Exceeding great. What more could God say about these? And precious promises that that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God is amazing. He, that, that his whole goal is to transform this world, uh, to transform each of us so that we can be uh, transform the world through, uh, one life at a time. So under the, under the Holy Spirit's working, even the weakest, by exercising faith in God, learn to improve their entrusted powers and to become sanctified, refined, and ennobled. So during the latter reign power of that early church, the, even the weakest of the weak, by exercising faith in God, learn to improve their entrusted powers and to become sanctified. They were made holy, refined, and ennobled. So these are amazing promises and amazing words. Now uh, Rich is going to just share a short testimony and then we'll, we'll wind up. Are you encouraged this morning? God is using the trials to grow us and to, to refine us so that we can, so that we can be his representatives in a broken world that desperately needs to see him. Thank you, Rich. Hello, everyone. 
Happy Sabbath. My name is Rich. I have many regrets. Uh, growing up was abusive and neglectful, but my parents did their best raising me and my brother. Uh, and having regrets, God is greater and he can uh, turn our sorrow into joy. Amen. My drug of choice was depression, not alcohol or drugs. I tried psychotherapy, and uh, anyways, I, uh, I joined a 12-step program, and like I said, I didn't have alcohol or drug problems, um, but I joined this group because I wanted to stop lying to myself. I would put on a happy face and I'd be denying how I really felt inside. And I'll be brief, so. Um, so I tried psychotherapy and prescription drugs with no benefit. Not until I read books by Peter R. Bregan, MD, did I understand that there are serious side effects of prescription meds. This doctor has been used as an expert witness in court cases. I do not, I repeat, I do not recommend going off these drugs called turkey. You can have life-threatening events like seizures or death. If you want to get off the meds, get medical supervision. Dr. Bregan's book, Medication Madness, helped me understand the chaos in my life. I lost good jobs and relationships. I couldn't think. And again, don't go off these meds by yourself without doctor supervision. In 1986, I attended Bill Gothard's week-long seminar, Basic Youth Conf Conflicts, based on the Bible. Most importantly, he said, if you are troubled with thoughts of suicide, to use scripture memorization to war against demonic forces. In John 8, 31 and 32, it says, if you abide in God's word, then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's King James. I used to be very fearful. And 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. God's love is perfect love. When faced with temptations, change your focus. I've learned this. If I say to you, don't think about the pink elephant, guess what? You are thinking about the pink elephant. Philippians 4, 8 talks about thinking on things that are pure, true, honest, just, lovely, and of good report. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't go where there's trouble. Diet has a lot to do with mood. If I eat a lot of sugar, two days later I'm tired and depressed. Junk food is just that, junk. Eat Twinkies and you'll get Twinkie brain. <laughs> I discovered I'm sensitive to caffeine, so I avoid it. It revs me up and then I crash. I take vitamin B complex instead. And there's the anacronym for new start, which helps me remember to change my lifestyle. N is for nutrition, E is for exercise, W is for pure water, S is for some sun exposure, T is for temperance, Totally avoid all injurious substances. A is for pure air. R is for rest or sleep. T is for trust in God. For me, this point is most important. Without spending time daily with Bible reading and prayer, I have a hard day. If we expect to be in heaven someday, do we read God's love letter to mankind, the Bible? And for the last three years, I fought 
negative thinking, big fight. But God's help, but with God's help, I'm winning. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. And the golden rule, Matthew 7, verse 12. If we treat people harshly, can we expect to be treated kindly? Matthew 12, 38, 12, 36 says, We will give account to, for every idle word to God in the day of judgment. That's very sobering. We need good friends who will help us and not tear us down. We are told to love our enemies do we hate our spouse? And it was just something I learned along the way. It's been a long journey for me. Fifty years ago, I decided to be more extroverted and not introverted. I knew at times I'd be misunderstood. I'd be hurt, but I don't regret my decision. Working in a factory, I learned to avoid drama. Life is full of drama. We have a choice every day, what will be our attitude? In the following quote by Charles Swindoll, he talks about playing on one string. And he recounts the story of a concert violinist was doing a violin solo. As he passionately played, one string after another broke, but he continued on playing. He had only one string left and finished the piece with a standing ovation. And here's his quote. Attitude by Charles Swindoll. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The one thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. We're delighted that uh, the Lord is taking you through on, on this amazing journey. And that uh, the good news is he, he hasn't given up on any of us yet. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Rich. I really appreciate your words. And I'm just going to finish with this, um, these uh, few words here. And it, uh, it, 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 it's, um, it's sort of what God is doing w in our lives. And uh, I'll just say this. Uh, this is from back at the Ministry of Healing where we started. It says, often he permits the fires of affliction to assail them, that's us, uh, that they may be purified. The fact that we are called upon to endure trials shows the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious which he desires to develop. So we may be going through a trial. There may be other people in our life going through trials. God is trying to use these to refine us and prepare us for heaven. He, if he saw nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time uh, uh, refining us. He does not cast worthless stones into the furnace. It is valuable ore he refines. The blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know the manner of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction to prove what temper they are, uh, are and whether they can be fashioned for his work. The potter takes the clay and molds it according to his will. He kneads it, he works it, he tears it apart, he presses it together, he wets it, he, he, then he dries it, he lets it lie for a while without touching it when it is perfectly pliable. 
he continues the work of making it a vessel. He forms it into a shape on the wheel. He polishes it. He dries it in the sun. He bakes it in the oven. Thus it becomes a vessel fit for use. So the master worker desires to mold and fashion us. He, we're, are we staying on the wheel, allowing him to do his job? And it says, and as the clay is in the hand of the potter, so we are to be in his hands. We are not to try to do the work of the potter. Our part is to yield ourselves to be molded by the master worker. So my invitation today is that we would yield to him and allow him to do the work that he needs to do and that we spend time getting to know him and trusting him and loving him every day in the word. Spend that thoughtful hour with Jesus and just meditate upon his love. Be beloved, think it, not uh, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as something strange uh, as, as some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Stay with Jesus in the process of refining. Stay with him, because one day, as it says here, one day, it says, when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad so with exceeding joy. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Precious Lord, we're so thankful that each one of us are on a journey with you. Each one of us are learning how to submit ourselves to you and let you do that refining work. Lord, it's hard work. It's not easy. Uh, but with you, the, clo the more we learn to depend on you, the more we learn to trust you, when we're doing your will, we will be doing our will. Lord, you're going to bring our wills together in perfect unity. And Lord, when, when, that, when it's time, when you pour out your latter rain power, Lord, the whole world will see the, in clarity what your loving character looks like. And the world will then make their final decision. Lord, we pray that you will prepare us for that day and prepare us for eternity. Thank you for each one. And Lord, right now, for those that are going through difficulties and trials, Lord, may they know that they are not alone, that you are there with them. You are there on this path with them and that they can be assured that somehow through your divine hand, you will work out the, the, the intensity of whatever they're dealing with, whatever we're dealing with, so that you will be honored and, and that, uh, that each individual in this, uh, in this trial, in this battle, in this situation will be uh, strengthened and ultimately we will all be able to enjoy eternity together. So Lord, we are so thankful that you have come on this mission to save your children and thank you, Lord, that you're with us every step of the way, now and for eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many would say, Jesus, take me and make me what you want me to be. Prepare me for your kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. closing hymn is number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. As far as possible, please stand as we sing hymn number 100.
in closing, Jude 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Precious Lord, thank you for visiting us today. And go with us now as we go out into the world around us, Lord. May we bring, may you be there every step of the way. May we constantly surrender to you, letting you do the special work that you have for us to do in this world, to lead others to see Jesus and be drawn to him. We thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.